All right. Hello, everyone. We're going to give people, um, we're sorry, we're a few minutes behind, but we're going to let people come on in. Thanks so much for spending a, a bit of time with us this evening. Well, welcome everyone to VMFA Fridays After Five Taste of Art. Uh, my name is Celeste Feta. I'm Director of Education at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, and I'm really pleased to welcome Will Carell, who's the founder of Busky Cider. Hi, Will. How's it going? It's going well. Thanks so much Good. for being here. We're excited Thanks to for having have me. you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and Will is joining us from a porch <laughs> out on the road. Um, and we're just so great that we could make this work um, on your busy um, entrepreneurial schedule. So thanks again yep. for, for being flexible and uh, joining us uh, today. Um, so a um, few little housekeeping, if you've never been with us before, or even if you had a need a, need a reminder, um, this is a webinar, um, which means that you can see us, but we cannot see you. So I always say use that to your advantage as you'd like. Um, uh, it also means um, that if you have any questions or comments, we're going to be using the chat feature tonight. So that's available at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, so please feel free to message um, in that area, comments about uh, what you're tasting or questions, and we'll try to get to those as they come in. Um, the um, other thing to keep in mind, um, if you wanted to open things as we go, um, definitely do that. Or if you'd like to open them now, that's great too. So that is how we will work this evening. Um, we're going to be learning about Busky Cider and some works of art that go along with it. So the first thing I'm going to do um, is ask Will um, to tell us a little bit about Busky Cider, where you're located, um, a little bit about the history of how you got started, and a little bit about what you make, what we'll be tasting tonight. Sure, thanks very much. It's good to, good to talk to you all today. I wish we were on the lawn of the, the beautiful VMFA, like, uh, like we usually are for these kind of tastings, but it's still always a, always a pleasure to hang out with you guys. And uh, yeah, so this is a, an interesting little snapshot uh, in history of where we are as a company right now. I'm sitting on a, a customer's porch in Northern Virginia where I'm doing deliveries. And uh, as uh, the pandemic started to roll out, we uh, shut down most of our traditional businesses, started doing deliveries, deliveries to people's doors. So um, this will be my first tasting I've ever done, uh, not from our space or a grocery store or an art gallery or something like that. Uh, also, because I'm on the road, I won't be drinking with y'all. So. Um, I, I can guarantee you from personal experience, ciders are good, but uh, I will be abstaining in this tasting. Um, but yeah, a little bit about um, me, my company, um, my family and our involvement in the company. Um, I started working on opening Busky as a senior at Hampton Sydney College, um, which is maybe an hour and a half west of Richmond. And uh, so I was making cider in the dorm room and then I won a small startup competition um, and I got a, a a small grant that felt like a lot as a college student that allowed me to um, invest in making some really uh, more professional grade cider and um, ultimately ended up uh, picking a really interesting building in Scott's Edition, which is about half a mile from the BMFA. So we are extremely close neighbors. Uh, we walk between them all the time and uh, do little staff outings to have coffee on the, uh, on the beautiful lawn and all. So um, definitely neighbors and um, yeah so as we as we opened uh, things we were prioritizing uh, using uh, as many locally sourced ingredients as possible so Virginia is one of the best apple uh, states in the country and has a beautiful tradition there uh, there's also a lot of founding fathers who are making cider um, and both for health and um, both for health and enjoyment because water wasn't necessarily safe and um, yeah, so we're focusing on Virginia apples. Um, I was very inspired by the craft beer scene as far as the um, like the community and the culture and the creativity of the American craft beer scene. But I loved the historic integrity of a lot of old ciders um, instead of kind of the mass-produced, uh, more soft drink-esque 
uh, ciders that were that most people still stereotype cider as. So most people would stereotype a cider as an extremely sweet, uh, somewhat syrupy, cloying beverage, uh, which can be enjoyable to many people, but uh, isn't quite what we're making. Uh, but also the far end of that spectrum is the extremely dry, very challenging, um, very challenging um, cider that is not necessarily inter introductory cider. So we wanted to be approachable and make the whole gamut. So we have things um, like the RVA cider was what I opened the company to make, and it is just an all Virginia apple cider. It's about half the sweetness of most ciders you uh, would have seen in grocery stores um, when we opened and still continues to be drier than many, uh, but it does have some sweetness, which is all from apples. Uh, so we don't add any sugar. Uh, and there's really nothing on there other than, than apples. We filter out the yeast that we ferment with. Um, but then we also make whimsical ciders that are um, things like the peach tea that we're gonna talk about, or things like we have a habanero. Uh, mango at the moment. We put hops in ciders. We barrel aged ciders. We have. We even made a Star Wars themed blue milk cider. Um, okay, wait a minute. Them. So yeah. I mean, people who know me know I'm a Star Wars geek nerd. Okay. So. Bantha milk. Okay. Yep. So <laughs> we. So we're we're is that willing available to available now. <laughs> it is not no, but oh, uh, but but some so some of it and kind of like a little bit of history with the logo. Uh, when we were doing this, I was like, I really like a lot of the really beautiful artisanal ciders, but I don't think they're as approachable. You know, for $20 in a, in a large bottle, that's not where you start your cider exploration, but some of the mass produced stuff on grocery store shelves wasn't, wasn't uh, sincere enough to the tradition uh, for us. So when we were doing this logo, we were like, hey, let's tie into the fact that the, the feds cut down the apple trees during prohibition to stop people from making cider at home. So we did a prohibition era guy. And then one of the things we did was... Um, we were like, hey, I want to make really serious cider, but I don't want to take ourselves too seriously, which is where something like Bantha Milk Cider comes from. Um, so that so the silly apple hat was, uh, you can't take yourself too seriously if you're wearing an apple hat. And uh, and then the other historic tie in there, and I think I saw, I'm, I'm seeing previews of questions at the bottom of my yes, screen. Yes, yes. People uh, are really interested in, in how you came up with the name. So, sure. um, and this is the inside of the cidery. We'll kind of just show that so people get a feel, feel for what it looks like uh, in the tasting room. Yep. Um, yeah, so, excuse me, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Are you, um, is the tasting room open right now during COVID? It is, it's very limited. Um, so the bar, the bar is not open uh, and the tables are, the tables have always been about six feet spaced apart, but now they're more than six feet. Um, so we're, we've gone above and beyond on, on spacing and we, we're using the, the warehouse more for people. So it is okay. open in a very limited capacity, but it is a very, a very safe and still enjoyable experience, even to some things like the board games that are common services are missing. Yeah. Um, and but yeah, it's it's still open and it's it is a safe place to um, to get out, but still, uh, you know, I mean, obviously there's some risk in going out in public, but we're taking it very seriously, and and our customers are as well, and we appreciate that. Uh, the question of where the word busky came from. So the word busky is a word that Ben Franklin, uh, this gentleman here, um, he was <clears throat> writing a letter to someone, and he basically was saying, here are a bunch of words that I am hearing in. The taverns that are not from Old English or French, these are just American drinking words or sayings. Uh, so there were things like, he chased his he chased his horse, he tipped the bucket, busky. Busky's in the middle of this long list. And um, we I wanted a historic drinking word that didn't have historic baggage. So there was no definition for it, no explanation. It's a somewhat common surname. Uh, we've I've probably served a dozen buskies uh, in our tasting room or at events. Uh, so there are, most likely it's named after a, um, a man or a woman in the in the pub whose name was Busky and had some sort of a reputation. Um, so we, uh, positive or negative, probably both. Um, but anyway, so we, we just, I wanted a whimsical historic word that we could make new, which is really fits the history of cider and where we are in cider, where there's so much old history, but it, the cider tradition completely disappeared after prohibition. And it's just now really getting traction over the last decade. So we wanted a old word with a new meaning and mm -hmm. that fit us well. So um, one of our guests is saying that she is so impressed you started this great cider from your college dorm room. Oh, thank you, I appreciate That's it. Very That's a, I, had a, I had a lot of help, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it was a good place to start. <laughs> Um, so let's try the first, uh, the first one. So okay. the Busky RVA cider. So if you're um, tasting with us, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pour it. Sorry, I'm on a makeshift little table here myself. So um, let's see. So I'm gonna. So question for you, Will, too. In sure. pouring cider, I mean, is it like pouring beer? Should we be pouring? You know, I'm pour not, it on the side, or do you like it in the middle? 
you'll pour down the side of your glass at roughly a 45 okay. degree angle. Four it is, it, you will not have a significant head on the cider, um, okay. unlike a beer. So if you pour a beer wrong, you'll end up with a lot of foam. Right. Uh, cider, even though it's carbonated, is relatively f flat. And that's largely because there are basically no natural proteins in apples. Um, so that is one of the significant differences. So it's going to be very clear. Um, hopefully a nice apple nose. And yeah. basically, uh, this is the simplest expression of cider that we could think of as far as, uh, but it's still being an approachable start. So it's uh, all apples from Nelson County in Tyro, Virginia specifically. Um, it, Virginia is one of the few states in the country where not only can you, but you also should work with local family farms that have been around for a long time. In most states, the apple orchards have been conglomerated or maybe there aren't even apple orchards. Uh, so we work with two family orchards in Nelson County and occasionally with a family orchard in Winchester, Virginia. Um, so we are the second biggest apple buyer for juice, um, at least for hard cider and for juice in the state, uh, but are still working with just three family farms, which is kind of cool. Yeah. Um, so Actually, the basic, I, I, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Tell me. Yo, you go well. Um, I was going to say, the, the, so the basics of the RVA, I mean, it, the intention was to make a simple introductory cider that set the benchmark for what we were going to do, which is no added sugar, no added corn syrup, no added uh, flavors, aromatics. So you get a delicate, light, drinkable cider. And I tend to like drier things. Most people who make cider also like drier things. At the same time, you the, there is a... There is at times snobbery in our industry where we act like something that is sweet uh, cannot have value. And that was one of the things that we pushed back on when we first opened saying, well, everyone drinks a mass produced cider. A lot of people drink a mass produced cider and say, this is cloyingly sweet, but it's a third of the sweetness of an apple. So maybe that's because they're adding corn syrup or sugar or something, not because they don't actually like sweetness. And virtually everyone likes fruit juice. Um, and, and you don't drink fruit juice usually and say that's too sweet. Maybe if you drink a gallon of it or something like that, but a sip of it is not unpleasant on your palate. Um, <clears throat> so the idea with this is we ferment the apple juice dry with the white wine yeast, and then we back sweeten with the same apple juice and all of that is fresh pressed. Um, fresh pressing apples throughout the year is surprising to people, but there are controlled atmosphere storage um, warehouses basically in the west part of the state. And it is a large refrigerator that also has controlled atmosphere. So you need oxygen and a few other gases for fruit to ripen. So if you replace those gases with um, nitrogen, argon and other inert gases, uh, the apples will hold other than a slight acid breakdown um, they hold throughout the year. So we're pressing fresh apples throughout the year uh, to make this cider. That's so cool. We're getting a lot of great comments about um, that it has a great balance of dry and sweet from the apples. And I would definitely agree with that. And it has a pleasant taste. And I thank you for not adding sugar. Um, and I agree. I have to tell you, like, usually when I think of cider, like you said, I'm like, oh, it's sweet. It's sweet. Sorry, um, you're breaking up on so, me. Oh, can you hear me, Will? Will is kind of frozen. I don't know if anyone else is not hearing Will. I'm sorry. Oh, there you go. I got you no, back for I, a second. Uh, yeah, I can hear you now. Sorry. Okay, but, good. Right. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, I was just saying that, like sometimes think sometimes I think you're I think you're definitely right. There's kind of a reputation for cider of like being too sweet, and and honestly, mm -hmm. when I think of cider, that's what I think too. I am like so happy with this right now. Oh. <laughs> um, um, I agree. It's definitely, it just has a really nice balance and I do really like the dryness of it, but it just kicks in with that apple mm. kind of at the sure. end. And I, I, it's really good. Um, yeah. really good. And someone yeah. also has a question, two questions. Sure. Um, one hops and cider does Busky make one? Yes. Uh, okay. so we, we virtually always have a hopped cider and um, we've done a lot of experimentation there and you know similar again like i said we 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 admire the craft beer scene a lot and one of the things i really like is founders who actually visit where their hops are from all, all pretty much all respectable cider makers are going to visit their orchards as our main ingredient but um, my wife and i went out to yakima valley in washington where most of our hops are grown and toured the hop farms and the production facilities with the teams less because we're inspecting their quality because they're the experts and more that that's really when you learn and have your education but <clears throat> so we've probably used roughly 20 uh, types of hops and we uh, a couple times a year we'll do an event where we'll have six different ciders that will each have a different hop in it so people can actually learn what that hop tastes like and um, there is a, a reasonable case to be made that um, cider is actually a better base for tasting hops 
uh, than mm -hmm. beer because the, the the brightness and the the brightness acidity and carbonation of the cider really bring a lot of the hop characteristic forward um where in beer it you know it blends with all the malt character and all which is which is delightful and is um, obviously hops are more of a beer ingredient but uh, yes, yeah, so we do a lot of hop ciders. Um, we do both hazy hop ciders, so styling them after a New England IPA, um, <clears throat> and also clear hop ciders. Uh, we do fruited hop ciders, um, and yeah, so we have kind of three styles of cider. At the moment, we're just finishing up the last few cases of our uh, plum hop cider. Uh, so it's a plum, plum, and then there's lotus hops, um, oh, nice. and that was that was a that was a pretty intense one. And then we are we are talking to a couple of breweries about who our next collaboration will be. Okay. Um, so anyone wants to drop a, a brewery that you think would be a good uh, partner for us to collaborate with, uh, we'd love to hear that. Great. Or you can send it to our Facebook or something. Great. Um, and then another question more on the process of making the cider. When you back sweeten, how do you keep the yeast from reactivating? Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons the product is so clear is, um, is sterile filtration. Uh, so we use uh, cross flow filtration. And then after that, basically liquid pasteurization. Okay. Um, but the sterile filtration is primarily, so we get the yeast out of solution. Okay. And then another question, do you have one location in Richmond, uh, just one location? Um, are you thinking about opening in other Virginia areas? <clears throat> yeah, so we have our, the, the public facing area has always been our space in Scott's edition. Uh, we also, during COVID with just how much inventory got messed up, we picked up another warehouse uh, in Shaco Bottom, and are because it has a lot of outdoor space, we're considering possibly putting a space there as well, um, and maybe turning one of our spaces into more of a barrel-focused location, the other one into more clean. But uh, Scott Station will always be our our headquarters and home. Uh, we also have a tasting room in Cape Charles, Virginia, uh, which is on the Eastern Shore. It's a delightful town, and yeah. basic. I just uh, some fans asked me to go out there and check it out, and it seemed improbable, but I fell in love with the town, so we opened the tasting room there. Um, and we are, we constantly have uh, developers and landlords reach out to us and customers uh, in different places. So I'm in Northern Virginia right now, and um, it would make sense to put a tasting room here, but also the real estate prices are very high and, um, and we're not particularly flush coming out of COVID. Um, we're also, it's a bit Norfolk always comes to mind. Um, yeah. I really like, I really like Roanoke a lot. So I wouldn't be surprised if we did projects um, somewhere in Northern Virginia, Roanoke and Norfolk. Um, throughout the years. We'll, we certainly will continue to look for spaces and uh, think about that, but Richmond will always be home and, uh, and Scott's Edition is a perfect neighborhood for headquarters. Yes, yes it is. All right, well, I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna take a look at a work of art that relates to okay. um, the straight up apples in, in this, this cider. Um, so this work is from the museum's collection. It's called Cider Stand, Blue Ridge Mountains, Virginia and taken in 1935, um, printed a little bit later. Um, and it's by Arthur Rothstein, um, and we'll talk a little bit about him um, in a minute, but kind of focusing on the image, and I'll show you all a more blown up version. Just wanted to make sure you saw who it was by and when it was made. Um, so this, is, this was taken in the Shenandoah um, Mountains, by Arthur Rothstein, who was hired by um, the resettlement um, department. So kind of later known as the kind of the, during the WPA, during the 1930s. And so as kind of parks were being made, um, including Shenandoah National Park, um, a lot of families and farms had to be rehomed or moved to make way for, for that national park land. And so he was assigned and hired by the administration to photograph residents and really the lives of these people. And so this is a photograph probably, you know, if you've been in the Shenandoah uh, region or you're from there um, and there's still, you know, a side um, on the side of the road, you know, vendors selling apples, like you said, uh, Virginia is definitely an apple state. Um, so this was kind of a no brainer to connect with the RV cider, um, just be, you know, that apple taste is just so delicious and, and prominent. And so this is just a gentleman that he saw, you know, probably again on the side of the road and, and took a picture of a stand. And what's really interesting about this piece to me too, is the two different spellings of cider. So on the left, there's a sign um, that cider is spelled with an S. So S-I-D-E-R and apples are also spelled differently, A-P-P-E-L-S. 
S as opposed to L E S. Um, but then on the immediate right of him, Apple Insider is spelled as we know it today. So I was kind of chatting with Will about this, kind of any theories on why it would be spelled that way. So I don't know, Will, what do you think? I mean, there, there are a lot of, there are a lot of spellings for cider and, um, and, you know, uh, cider is such an old beverage uh, that there are a lot of traditions that come together from around the world. And I mean, even so far as like my wife is, um, you know, is a linguist and is fluent in Spanish. And when we were in Spain, sp touring, um, touring um, cideries, we were telling them that we owned a cidery and they were understanding that as we owned a bar that poured cider, even though that seemed like how it translated because they didn't use the word cidery or cideria, they used um, yager, which looks kind of like lager with two L's. It was just like strange. Yeah, so cider has a very underdeveloped um, um, diction uh, from a lot of unique tra traditions, and I don't know that one specifically, but I do see those. And you know, sometimes it's a misspelling uh, by someone who's just writing a sign, and sometimes yeah. it is from another tradition from England or from Ireland or um, you know, someone translating from their understanding of German or something like that. Um, but I, I don't know that one specifically. Yeah, that's so interesting. I mean, and I, and I also wonder, you know, I mean, there's apple cider and then there's hard cider. So, and I mm -hmm. didn't ask you this question in advance, so sure. I'm not trying to share anything, but it's just occurring to me, you know, as sure. I'm looking at this is what is he selling? Is he selling the hard sure. cider um, or is he selling, you know, the unfermented version of apple cider. I mean, you can see kind of he's got some glasses sure. lined up and turned over. Sure. There's a bucket under the table, you mm -hmm. know, which may be the what he's is holding mm -hmm. the bottles. Um, so I don't know. So what I, so what I can tell you is whether he's trying to sell soft cider or hard cider, it's not going to stay soft for long because uh, the natural yeast in the apples, it's, it will start to ferment. And that's the, um, I mean, a lot of the, a lot of people who grew up in apple country will talk about how they would just open the lid and close it back and then just kind of like set it aside. And that was a, a fun way to end up with a lightly effervescent sparkling uh, cider. So, I mean, one of the reasons the feds cut down the apple trees during prohibition was the ease with which um, you can make cider. Now making professional cider, making consistent cider, things like that is, is, is different, but it is, you know, I, cer I certainly could just rub my beard over a glass of apple juice in a few days. It would, it would have alcohol in it. I mean, there is a, <laughs> There's yeast in the air. There's certainly yeast in my beard, um, and that's uh, the um, so I mean, it, the most likely. Basically, there's a, there's not much distinction um, if you don't drink it immediately, um, and cider because he they wouldn't have had the refrigeration to oh, yeah. uh, to keep it cold enough for very long. Uh, so generally, if you're buying apple juice from the grocery store, it's going to either be pasteurized or it's going it's going to be pasteurized or it's going to be um, have preservatives in it generally if you don't if it's not going to ferment okay. and um, a pasteurized cider once it's exposed to yeast again can still ferment um, so the reason one of the big reasons the feds cut back on the apples um, the sorry on the on the apples and cut them down during prohibition was if you put a barrel of apple juice in your basement which there's a lot of great quotes about how every American family had a, a barrel of cider in the basement or in the cellar um, over the reason you could do that and you could drink it throughout the year was that it would it would ferment instead of spoiling so eventually you would end up with a hard cider instead of fresh juice and the whole family would drink it because it's safer than the water so if the feds come in and they see a still they know you're making moonshine you can't say that you're using the still for something else um, I mean you can technically but no you're using it for moonshine where you're like oh is that cider on my in my refrigerator gone bad um, yeah. sorry my bad so the, you know oh, that was gotcha. And that's one of the, I always, I always joke that uh, if you're 21 in college, um, that's the easiest way to end up with cheap alcohol is just buy apple juice from the store and uh, put some yeast in it. And that's a, it's a good way to start. And that's, I started out a little more sophisticated than that, but not much. And it can turn into, <laughs> it can turn into a cidery. That's awesome. Um, and someone also noted that the cider with the S looks much older. Yeah. So kind of wondering if this is sort of a, a repurposing, you know, or a or a vintage sign, even vintage in the mm. 19, in 1935 to use again, definitely a good point. Um, even has like a piece of wood sort of hammered into the front of it. So mm. kind of wondering if it's been repaired over the years and sure. uh, used over and over again. Um, so yeah, it just, this photograph is just, um, I think just really, I love that it's of Virginia, you know, and gets that, that real history and ties back to, like you were saying, the sort of a tradition. 
of, of cider in Virginia, which again, I, I think it's great that you're tapping into that and bringing that back and, and making a modern twist on it. Um, sure. And like I, like I mentioned, Arthur Rothstein, you know, really interesting guy. This is him pictured on the left um, about the same time that he shot this photograph actually in 1935. Um, so what he would have looked like um, taking this picture. Um, as I mentioned, he was hired to document um, families and, and really get to know families and show them in a very humanistic way. Um, and what their lives were really like um, during this process of resettlement. And he traveled all over the South um, uh, to do this. And I just offer another photograph. This is not in the museum's collection, unfortunately. I wish it was. But this is of Annie Petway Bendolph um, from Gee's Bend, Alabama, taken in 1937. So he went down there, again, on assignment um, to photograph the families of Gee's Bend, which um, was a plantation, former plantation, um, and sorry, I have a visitor coming here. Um, so sorry, sorry about that. Life on Zoom. Um, so um, a former former plantation um, that he went to, that this entire family, several generations, lived on and and worked on, um, still. Um, in the 1930s and generations and descendants still live there today and they became very well known and are still known now for these amazing quilts um, and the reason that i reference this as part of arthur rossian's work and this is what makes you know researching art and, and kind of going down a rabbit hole into the collection our collection is huge you know we, we have like 40,000 works of art um, we actually have a seven quilts from the Petway family. So this is a great kind of through line from Arthur Rothstein, um, the, the Virginia Apple picture, right down to um, actual objects from, you know, his travels um, or from an area from his travels. This is Housetop by Rita Mae Petway, who was um, actually um, here not too long ago um, to give a talk. We had did a show called this um, Cosmologies, which pulled from the Souls Ground Grown Deep Foundation which gifted us a uh, gift purchase, um, a huge collection of African-American art, including this work by Rita May. Um, and this quilt is a very modern looking quilt uh, made in 1977, but based on a pattern, the housetop pattern, which is sort of these squares that um, repeat or interlocked with each other. Um, again, passed down to her from generations, including the woman that, we, that was pictured, Annie Bendolph. Um, and you can see some of her quilts at the Metropolitan Museum of Art um, as well. So I just love this kind of connectivity, you know, thread line through um, the collection. And if you um, wanna know more about the quilts or again about Arthur Rothstein or see more of his images, we have about 30 of his images in the collection. So you can go to our collections page and search by his name and see everything else that we have by him. And he, again, after he did this project, he went on to work for Look Magazine and then Parade Magazine. He, he taught um, at several universities and he actually taught Stanley Kubrick um, and he taught Chester Higgins as well, who is, who is uh, also represented in our collection. Um, just really interesting, interesting man and, and did a lot, again, photography that really looked at the humanist aspect of his subjects. So I definitely encourage you to, to check that out. So um, let's talk about the next uh, offering that you have for us, the tart cherry. And I'm gonna switch my glass here and open this one. And, um, well, could you also talk about why this is a larger size can as compared sure. to the to the RVA cider? So here's the tart cherry. Sure. Um, so you'll notice if you don't have it that this one is a stickered can as well. And uh, in the craft scene, um, the 16 ounce stickered can has kind of become the um, the normal package for um, the normal package for. Uh, limited release and special products. Um, there's a few reasons for that. If you're mobile canning, you pay per can full, fill. Generally, you only pay for one lid. Uh, you only pay for one label for uh, for more liquid. Um, so that that's one of the reasons. Um, the we've had we had this originally in 12 ounce and now in 16 ounce. One of the reasons that most of our cans are heading towards 16 ounce, even if they were 12, uh, is that uh, with uh, supply shortages with COVID, uh, the large producers have tried to squeeze out small producers by. Uh, taking up all the 12 ounce can supply, but um, large producers don't use 60 ounce cans quite as predominantly. So, um, so a lot, we've been using 60 ounce cans for a lot of our ciders, but 
a lot of our friends uh, that are small producers are also switching to 16 ounce. Um, it is a pint. Um, so the, I mean, people make the joke a pint for the road, which obviously I'm not implying um, drinking and driving, but um, there is something about, you know, we, the pint is sort of the, the standard in the US and other places, uh, something like a pint. Um, so it is 16 ounces. And uh, it's a larger, considering that a lot of these cyrus are very art focused. Um, so my wife does the designs and you know you can tell that there's a decent amount of detail and a design that goes into them. It's a larger canvas. Um, so the, uh, we'll actually be switching the 12 ounce RVA can. It's always been 12 ounce to a 60 ounce can. And it'll be our last 12 ounce. That is because of getting squeezed on supplies and, uh, and just competing with larger. Uh, larger competitors and uh, being able to simplify um, all of our supplies down to just one size box and uh, one size of twist wrench for the canning line and a lot of boring stuff that y'all can come take a tour at the cidery at some point if you'd like to uh, like to know that side but might be a little uh, might be a little beyond the scope of today's conversation. <laughs> so I just poured um, the tart cherry and I and I love the, the uh, label designs that your wife does but I just find they're just so fun and um, I, yeah, I just, I just think they're really great. So kudos to her um, for, for creating these. Um, so I just poured it and it definitely has, a, I mean, you can see, at least I can, um, this blush kind of color coming mm -hmm. out, you know, much, much more so obviously than the, than the RVA cider. So I just hold sure. them up so you can see the difference between the two. So is that from the cherries? It is uh, yeah. directly so, kind of pressing this. Do you press mm -hmm. the whole cherry? Nothing but the cherry. Yeah. So the <laughs> after after the cherries de pitted, uh, then it is um, it's pressed and we add it. We and we back sweeten with the cherries like we do with the apples, which uh, we do that for two reasons. One of them is a good reason, which is that um, you know fruit is delicious in its natural juice form, and the second reason is a dumb one, which is the government taxes uh, different fruits differently when they're fermented, which is an oversimplification, but. Um, this can would be a couple dollars more expensive if we fermented the cherries instead of back sweetening with it, which is a, a law that will hopefully get changed and we would still make this cider this way, but other ciders we might ferment uh, the fruit that we add, um, but we generally don't. It's it's not impossible and there are producers who do, um, but if you, you, you pay more taxes if you register it correctly. Um, so the cherry cider, um, it has it is a very nice blush color. A lot of cherry ciders are darker. Um, people sometimes wonder if that means we add less cherry. Um, in reality, we add an extraordinary amount of cherry, uh, but we use a cherry that, well, most most cideries use pretty heavily uh, dark cherry, which is kind of the, it's one of the American standard cherries and it's it's a perfectly fine cherry. Um, we used to use it half and half with the Montmorency cherry because we wanted the dark color and Montmorency is what we use, but Montmorency is, we think one of the best tasting fruits we've ever had. Um, Montmorency is much more expensive. Dark cherry is much cheaper. Um, and as we made the cider, we're like, this is a really good cider. Any, any fans that are on here that have known us for a long time, the cider's changed a lot. And when we first made it, it was a good cider, um, but it wasn't, it wasn't special. Um, and so we made the choice. We're like, you know, we think our fans could forgive not having a dark blood red color, having a lighter color, but a much more like aromatic. And like, it's, it's got the, you know, a lot of the feeling of biting into a cherry uh, with this. Um, so we changed our recipe a couple of years ago and, uh, you know, it's, it was much more expensive and we were curious if customers would appreciate that or not. And that we're, we're validated that our customers do have good taste and they're willing to uh, think outside the box. Um, so uh, it's a, it's a very simple cider. I mean, one thing that is a little different for Busky than a lot of other cideries, and I'm not, I'm not saying one is better or not, but this is a strong preference for us uh, is that um, we, um, so like the RVA, and the tart cherry, very similar sweetness. And so most people would assume that we just added cherry to the RVA. Um, and that would be a fine way to do it, but it would be less interesting. So we use a different yeast strain, usually a different blend of apples. The apple blends change throughout the year, but diff there's different apples in this can. There's a different yeast strain fermented at a different temperature in a different size tank. And that matters more than it seems like it would, the shape of the tank. Um, so even though there are a lot of similar similarities of the apples being grown on you know, the same land, and press the same way. Um, we spend a lot of time on these little details that you couldn't really pick out. Uh, you can't really pick out in the finished product, but you can tell if you don't do it. So when you go in, you taste five ciders, and at the end, your palate is a little bit bored. It's probably because the same base was used for all five. And and again, there's nothing wrong with that. But um, we are we are in a fun spot where we're the. I always say that we're the biggest cidery uh, that would do some of the projects we do, but the smallest that could. And we have the scale to do these larger batches of interesting projects that allow us to do them completely uniquely. 
um, but also we're, if we're a bigger company, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to um, be as creative and um, make as many brilliant moves and mistakes as we get to. So we're having um, just a couple questions coming in, but also sure. again, um, compliments. Uh, so very crisp and no lingering sugar taste, just enough cherry. I would definitely have to agree. And you get that tartness right at the end, mm -hmm. you know, after I've sipped and, and that you, the cherries up front, and then that tart hits you in the back, but it's, mm. yeah, it's, it's got a great, um, I don't know, again, smooth and just yeah. not, not sweet at all. I just, I'm liking this yeah, one too. You. I don't know which one I like better yeah. yet, but, but. Well, the, the three things people expect from a cherry cider would be um, the addition of sugar or corn syrup or something like that. So that we don't do that. Obviously we've gone over that. The second one would be a heavy addition of acid. Um, so one of the ways you can disguise a cheaper cider is by adding a lot of acid. It gives you that mouth puckering feel. So we don't ever add acid to our ciders. And and sometimes like the RVA might even benefit from a little bit of acid, but we think that our customers really enjoy um, the expression of fruit, even if even if you could doctor the fruit and maybe even make it a little better sometimes. Um, that is the, not, it, but it, it is a proof that we use quality ingredients. And then the third one, and this is the real travesty is like fake ingredients or um, amusingly. And if you haven't done this experiment, Take um take any kind of drink and put a couple drops of almond extract in there and it'll taste like a tart cherry version of that thing. Um, so there's a lot of fake ways to make something taste like cherry and uh, and and when you can't really tell that it wasn't cherry, there's still something wrong in your palate can usually tell. Uh, so again, it's just kind of an exercise of simplicity. Um, and these are two of our simplest ciders, and I'm proud of them for that. Even if we do some pretty wacky stuff as well. Uh, yeah, definitely. And I, I, um, there's uh, one more, two more questions more again on, on sort of sure. in, one on ingredients and one on kind of container. So I'll do ingredients yep. first, since we're chatting about that. Sure. Do you have a favorite apple that you use in particular? Sure. Um, so the America, so we use the whole range of apples and that's from extremely high end apples like Ashby Colonel and Harrison all the way down to red delicious, which is actually can be a very nice part of a blend, but is not a very, um, it's not a it's not a cherished um, apple variety and not a very pleasant eating apple, um, but it ju it's juice and a blend does do nicely and it does keep uh, base of a cider more um, more affordable. Um, and one of the big things we did when we opened was I went and talked to a bunch of orchards and I said, hey, like, what do you like about cideries and what do you really not like about cideries you work with? And they said, we love that they are interested in historic apples and the really interesting apples and are willing to pay a premium for them. And then and then I said, OK, and what do you dislike? And they said, we hate that they come in here and act like the whole range of apples are not good apples and there's no value in them. Um, so I said, hey, like let's make ciders from every apple that Virginia makes, and we do. Um, so unapologetically, we you know we use cheap, um, you know, red delicious apples, and we use you know, more expensive like Gold Rush and stuff in the RVA blend. Um, and I think there's a lot of value in those uh, when they're blended correctly. Um, and then we really enjoy the heritage apples that a lot of our wonderful um, heirloom. Um, comrades or competitors, however you want to see it, use. Uh, so I would say our staff favorite, as far as an apple standing alone, is probably the Ashmead Kernel, um, which if you, we're not tasting the Heritage today, but the Heritage cider we have out right now um, is a blend of Ashmead Kernel and Gold Rush, which are two of our favorites. Um, so those are both her those are both heirloom apples. They, they were grown specifically for cider making. They have really nice tannic structure and acid. Um, so you know, while we do really focus on uh, a lot of our blends and stuff. We also really enjoy getting into some of the more esoteric apples and are very excited to see a lot of those traditions coming back. I'm gonna move us to the art real quick because I wanna make sure we have time to get that peach, that peach one. Um, so I'm gonna save the question about glass versus aluminum for when we get to the peach. <sighs> and I'm gonna invite my son not to come in here anymore. Okay, so the... <laughs> The work of art that I chose for this piece, uh, very literal, you know, matching up the flavor. This is Cherry Tree from the 1930s by Adela Clark, Clark um, who is a Virginian artist. Um, and she is depicting a cherry tree in her Chamberlain Avenue house yard, the yard in her house. So somewhere on Chamberlain Avenue, there were cherry trees that bore fruit. Um, you can see kind of the, um, little red dots here, also, also could be flowers, very impressionistic, you know, very short brush strokes, um, probably just taken, you know, in an easel in her yard um, outside. And Adela Clark, really um, interesting uh, history and, and woman. She, this is her pictured on the left. 
Um, and she was a suffragette, really one of the leaders of the suffragette movement in Virginia and in Richmond in particular. Um, also um, trained artist, she worked under William Merritt Chase in New York and um, came back to Virginia, to Richmond. And she would set up her easel in the middle of the street to kind of do art. And as people came, approached, approached her to talk, she would launch into a Votes for Women um, kind of a, a um, talk. So really pioneer um, in a lot of ways. She also started um, the Richmond Arts Academy, which was the forerunner to the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. So we really consider her one of our founding uh, mothers of the institution. Um, she's also recognized for her work in uh, the women's vote movement and the um, women's memorial um, or monument at um, the um, Capitol in Richmond. So on the right is um, a sculpture of her holding a Votes for Women flag. So we're really pleased to have this work in our collection. It's actually on tour right now on our uh, art mobile, our Virginia on, uh, Museum of Fine Arts on the road, BMFA on the road. So coming to a location near you, I'm sure soon, even during COVID, we have adapted much like Will has um, during the pandemic. So, um, you know, strict social distancing, we limit the number of people on the truck, of course, masks are required. Um, and so if, you, if it's coming to you, if you see it's coming to you, definitely go on board so you can see this work in person. Mm -hmm. So last but not least, we're going to talk about the peach tea cider. So our last selection here, um, and I'm going to grab that from under my magic table here. It just produces cider. <laughs> so let me also grab a glass. So um, definitely open the last one if you have it with you. And I'm gonna pour this one. So, oh, it's a totally different color than what I was expecting. I don't know, I was expecting like peach peach. But again, very close to the, I don't know if people can see that, very pale. So tell us, oh my gosh, I can really smell, oh, that's so strong peach, but also tea. I mean, that just hits you right where it should, right, Well. Yeah, so one of the things that I always have to explain with this, and okay. I think it's really neat, is there's actually no peach, like juice or flesh in this one. So it is peach blossoms. Uh, which is pretty pretty remarkable. You get so much peach character from blossoms. Um, so we the the history of the, so it's peach blossoms and white tea. And the uh, the history of this cider I think is a fun one. So obviously I and my uh, production team are you know, professional cider makers and have you know gone through a lot of training and you know, sometimes it's science and sometimes it's magic and sometimes it's just goofing around. Um, but it is always a very um, it's always a very team oriented thing. And we had a batch that we needed to decide what we we're going to do with it. And my wife had been in Carytown Teas, uh, which is, if you're not from Richmond, is just an, a spectacular uh, place run by a spectacular uh, group of ladies. Um, and um, she had been in there and the, um, the lady who runs Carytown Teas told her that they were being forced out of their space. They'd been in for probably 20 years that they're named after, you know, Carytown Teas. They were in Carytown. They were being forced out because the space was getting um, turned into a grocery store. Um, and she tried this tea and loved it. So she came in and said, hey, I'd really love to see if this tasted good in cider uh, because, uh, and I, she's like, and maybe if it goes well, we'll put it on a label and give them a shout out. So Pete with their new address on it and also people can know where to go to find them when they move because obviously that's tough to lose your location. Uh, so they're a pretty small little tea shop but they make all their teas and they're all custom. <clears throat> oh, sorry, custom. They, they make them in house with their own recipes. Um, so we put it in cider and we're like, wow, that's spectacular. We had no idea you could put tea in cider and we'd never heard of a tea cider at this point. Um, so I call them up and I say, Hey, like, um, I don't know how much I'm going to need, but you know, usually when you go in a tea place, you order three or four ounces. And I was like, could you do 30 pounds, something like that? They're like, wow, that's a huge order for us, but yeah, we can do it. Just give us a little bit of notice. So we made it extremely well received and just blew the doors off the place. So the next year I call back and ask for four times as much. And then the next year, you know, a couple of times as much again, and to the point where they had to hire a couple of new employees. And uh, I think we were a pretty large percentage of the tea they sell in the year at wholesale. They give us a good deal. They're wonderful partners. Uh, you should absolutely check them out um, if you like tea. Even if you don't like tea, they'll convince you to like tea. But yeah. um, one of the funny stories there that goes back to our sourcing, but also uh, sometimes when you choose the right partners, you don't have to worry about sourcing. Um, just like when you drink a busky, you know that we've been intentional with our ingredients. So you don't have to ask necessarily. You can ask, but you don't have to. Same thing there. I get a call from her, I guess last year when we were starting getting ready to make this batch and I'd already ordered a huge amount of tea. Um, 
And she calls and she's like, I'm so sorry, I can't make the tea the way we've made it in the past. And I'm horrified. I'm like, I've already sold a thousand gallons of the cider before we've made it. You know, I really need this product. I was like, what's, what's the issue? And she says, well, we always use 100% Virginia white tea, but you bought out the entire harvest. But we had, so we had to get the rest from France. And I'm, I am somewhat paraphrasing here, but essentially we bought everything available from the harvest and uh, which is really fun. I was like, absolutely. We'll use French tea. That's fun. Uh, so it's just fun when, when local businesses work together and have similar ideologies. Uh, and when you work with a, um, I, I love the VMFA. So working with local organizations, uh, it just turns, it turns into magical moments and uh, things that I hope all of y'all can uh, enjoy. So, um, yeah. yeah, so that I means it, it's, a, it's a, it is apple cider and tea and, um, works out nicely. Yeah, just um, really delicious. And um, I just again, kind of reading just a comment, uh, very light across the palate, tastes like local tea insider and very impressive. Thank you for going the extra mile. Um, so two, two questions. Again, I, I said I would ask this one question. Is there a difference in terms of tasting the cider in the aluminum can versus in the glass? So if you drink straight out of the can yeah. versus out of mm -hmm. the glass, mm -hmm. the, so the biggest difference is going to be that it's pretty hard to smell um, the cider coming out of a can. Um, so, I mean, it is, uh, that would be the biggest difference. Um, I would say that to, if you were going to write down a description of the cider and really be intentional, you should definitely put it in the glass, but the ciders are all fine coming out of a can as well. Um, and that's, and that is obviously we're pretty, we're pretty can centric and, and very approachable and casual. Um, I am a little unusual in the cider industry that I don't like to talk about tasting notes. Um, I don't like to tell people what they should expect to taste. I like to tell people why they taste it. Um, mm -hmm. and that's the same thing with the cans. I mean, if you want to be as intentional as possible, you should absolutely drink out of a, like a glass that has a nice bowl and, and rolls the aromatics to you. But I'm also never going to tell you how to drink my cider. Um, I, a customer opened a cider earlier on their front porch and dropped a couple ice cubes into it. And that is not how I drink my cider. And that is wonderful. <laughs> they were happy. They were enjoying the cider. Um, so, I mean, we are, we are approachable um, and we're approachable and you can enjoy it however you want. But um, I, personally, a glass is probably a better drinking experience. I would say the same thing about art, you know, what I love to talk about art and, um, but I just hearing people's impressions that's why you know if you have impression of the work that you'd love to share in the chat i would love to hear it that's what makes webinars kind of tough um and talking about art but i would definitely it's it's i think it's a thing that you know when you're making cider like you do well i mean it's definitely an art form and i think you you put a lot of again thought and into the ingredients much like an artist would put thought into what medium they're using so and and i just love that that you appreciate what the taster is doing, you know, and what they're what they're tasting and what's their preference, um, and what they bring right to the experience, and that's how we 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 talk about art and think about art too. So um, it's great to see that connection. Um, another another really again kudos. So impressed. We didn't think we'd like peach tea cider because it sounded like it would be thick or sweet, and it's not. It's awesome. Your Thank cider you. is amazing, and we really admire your commitment to staying local. Absolutely. Um, and we're going to look at one work of art um, to go with this piece. Um, it's sort of local, not as local as the other ones, um, but close. So this is um, William Smith and his grandson. Um, and William Smith used, lived in Maryland. So just up north, just, just a touch up, up north um, to our neighbors uh, in Maryland. And um, the uh, the image is a, is a portrait, and he is um, kind of cradling the head of his grandson, who is holding a peach. So that's our connection with the peach tree cider. Um, and he did have a peach orchard on his um, farm, Utah Utah farm, or Utah estate in Maryland. Um, and he's holding um, the branch of a tree, and you can see a pruning knife um, in the foreground there on the table, and another branch that he has been cut just to the right there. Um, and the detail shows the peach and, and uh, a little bit of a close up and him holding that sprig. And so you sort of just imagine, you know, the grandson has been out um, and picked a peach to bring to his grandfather, you know, who's accepting it lovingly. Um, and this is pretty, um, you know, a little bit different in terms of portraits um, post revolutionary war, you know, he is relaxed. Um, we see he's so relaxed, he's forgotten to button or he's misbuttoned um, his shirt. You can see that kind of like fabric sort of poking out there. Um, so kind of this is like, you know, post-revolutionary work cash, um, just relaxing um, 
after um, kind of maybe a hard day or he's been reading, uh, learning about farming. So this also equates to the ideal, you know, American, I should say white male American um, who was farming. Um, and he actually was not a trained farmer. He was a merchant um, and kind of ships um, and um, importing. Um, so this is sort of like him getting to, like on his, his sort of country estate look. Um, and he was actually campaigning to be a member of the US Congress. So this is a little bit of political fare um, to kind of appeal to the every, every man um, for, for their vote. Um, but this really was a place and you can see the peach tree in the background um, and then his house or his estate and then a mill as well, which was also on the farm um, or on the estate, which was not on the estate are the columns behind him. This did not exist. This is a made up building. <laughs> um, so it is a little, a little fake, um, but again, sort of signifying his, uh, his sort of stature or relatability to the government. So Again, everything is in here for a reason, but I just love that this really centers on the peach um, and sort of using that as the connection between generations um, and, and really a, showing a, a bit of softness and care um, for his grandson, which again, um, this became more popular um, in portraits. Yes, innocence for sure. Um, and also passing on. So the idea is, you know, he's passing on this love of cultivation and taking care of the land um, to his grandson. Lots of lots of history behind kind of the family. Um, his son-in-law who commissioned this portrait served under General Washington. Um, so was part of, of the Revolutionary War and um, Utah, the name E-U-T-A-W is named after Utah Springs, which is the site of a battle in South Carolina that his son-in-law fought in. So there are all these little connections. And I, I think about, you know, Busky, you know, maybe they said the word Busky <laughs> because, you know, they were around the time of, of the Revolutionary War when Ben Franklin was around. So come and come full circle with this, sure. with this image. Um, and real Charles Wilson Peel um, was, um, is the artist and he trained under Benjamin West coming out of London really interesting guy. Um, this is a portrait of, that he did of himself, the artist in his museum, and really considered kind of the founding, a founding father of museums in America. So he created this museum in, um, in Pennsylvania, and this is from the Pennsylvania Academy of Arts collection in Philly. And you can see the sort of, he's got his artist palette. Again, everything is, is there for a reason, just like we saw in the portrait that he did. Um, of Charles Wilson Peel. This is a really fun, again, I could go on and on about this painting and kind of dive into the background, but encourage you to, to look that up and, and learn more about his sort of unveiling uh, his collection in the background. So just, just a fun um, connection back to, to the peach um, and the strong peach notes I'm getting off of this, this cider, which is really wonderful. So, um, I am going to also say thank you to Busky. Um, just to reiterate, you know, Will was saying about partnerships, and I think, you know, Busky not only being a great um, maker of cider, I think really um, supports community. And um, I'm just really thankful they've done something great for VMFA. So through March 15th, um, you can use this link here. And I think, I think I can copy this and put it in the chat. Um, or maybe Kristen, if you could maybe copy it and put it in the chat. Um, but if you, you click on this link and it'll take you through an ordering form, if you're interested in ordering anything from Busky. So beyond the selections that we um, shared tonight, um, and you use this link through March 15th, a portion of the proceeds will go back to the museum. So thank you, thank you, Busky. That is so kind sure. of you um, to do that and share that. Um, and just, we really appreciate that. Um, I think that goes an extra extra mile for us. Yeah. So thank you so Absolutely. much. Absolutely. Uh, it is important that you follow that link and that after that, you won't see it in the checkout, but it'll recognize you through cookies um, that you have followed this link and then your transit. And if you come back another time, it'll still recognize you, but you do have to follow that link uh, exactly the first time uh, for our technology to catch you. So, uh, but then we'll be donating a a percentage of those proceeds and um, I'd like to I'll give a shout out from the partnership standpoint so uh, I, I obviously all of y'all know the VMFA or you wouldn't be on this call um, but um, one of the 
I think one of the most uh, impressive things to me when I was considering Richmond uh, and a couple other really cool cities that I still really care about uh, was I came to one of the Friday uh, happy hours, uh, Thursday or Friday happy hours. They're both really good. Uh, I think jazz and just the just mm -hmm. wine uh, or cider now. Um, anyway, I came to that and I was just so impressed um, that um, an art gallery was making art approachable, kind of like how I look at cider. And while the VMFA is a world-class museum, as we all know, um, letting people have drinks and have an approachable first experience, or, or you know, not first, but uh, was, was really great. And I really liked that. And it said that that was something I wanted to see in a community where we'd be investing. And uh, and then for me, it was very personally satisfying when the VMFA a few years ago picked our cans up. And I think the VMFA is probably our number one can purchaser for like on-site consumption uh, anywhere. So uh, that's certainly appreciated. And uh, always enjoy doing little outings and having cans on y'all's lawn and uh, walking through and looking at the exhibits and all. So uh, thanks for being a great part of the community and thanks for uh, having me in for this. This is neat. Thank you so much, Will. Oh gosh, it's so appreciated. I hope yep. we can do this again. We're getting a lot of great shout outs in the chat. Thank you everybody so much. Um, people are saying we could just go longer, which is mm -hmm. so nice. Um, and thanks Kristen for popping that uh, link into the chat. So if you're interested, Hover over that link. If you click it, it'll open a new window in your browser so you can bookmark it. Um, mm. You can also get all of these selections through VMFA to go. Um, they'll still be available. So, um, you know, do the selections through VMFA to go, buy more other things through, through, through the link um, and definitely support. Oh, great. And Audrey from Mount Vernon. Awesome. You're welcome. Uh, is enjoying this as well. Um, and uh, just for next time, um, if you enjoyed this, you know, please come back for more. Um, if you want to watch this again, you know, feel like you missed something, we always put these on our YouTube channel. Um, so you can check the, that playlist, um, Taste of Art, um, and just see, you know, go, if you just want to, you know, binge, binge all episodes on a Saturday, go for it. Um, yeah. And then uh, next time we're together is Friday, March um, 12th. We'll be tasting some wines from the American Northwest, actually focusing on Oregon and uh, Washington State. So definitely stay tuned for that. And then um, our next beer tasting is March 26th. We're going to be welcoming Justin Smith, who is the godfather of National Beer Day. I'm not sure what we'll be tasting yet, but I know it'll be fun. Um, so please join us for that. Um, again, thank you everybody. I really loving the comments. Um, people like knowing each other, which is, which is really great. Again, building that community. Um, and again, well, I, I really appreciate you calling in from the road from Northern Virginia, sure. uh, yeah. taking the time. And I just love your cider. I'm just so excited. I, yeah. I, I am having a, um, a uh, creamy doll with rice. So I'm trying to decide tonight which one is going to pair well with that. I might just have to go for the OG RV. So okay. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Um, a co couple other interesting observations before we're finishing this up. Um, we have a relative of or descendant of Johnny Appleseed on this call, which is pretty cool. <laughs> um, and uh, so Johnny Appleseed was planting apples all throughout uh, early America. And um, a cool little history fact there was um, a lot of those apples were being primarily planted for making cider um, because it was a safe way uh, to drink um, you know, soft cider or, or hard cider uh, because the water wasn't necessarily going to be safe. Um, similarly, in Virginia, there was a law that a landowner had to grow uh, grapes or apples uh, and make cider or wine for their neighbors um, because it was the easiest way to produce um, something safe to drink. Uh, and then the second one, I just did a delivery right before this call to um, a house that had a plaque on it that was uh, it was built on a Mount Vernon farm. So that was kind of a neat little tie into whoever it was that was from Mount Vernon. So I just uh, did that delivery and thought that was a neat little uh, a neat little tie in uh, for home delivery. So Great. that's it. I'm also being asked to say Alyssa and Trey are loving the ciders. I hope I'm saying Alyssa right. Alyssa. Awesome. That's great. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well. Uh, uh, oh, sorry, Alisa. Uh, Alisa. Uh, okay, thank you. All right, well, I really, again, appreciate everyone's time and um, enjoy the rest of the evening and enjoy your ciders. Thanks again for, for joining us tonight and wish you all a good evening. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>